In the absence of any meaningful binding global agreements to counter climate change, many countries are acting unilaterally to reduce emissions. Both the U.S. and the EU have announced several measures in this regard. But what impact will this have on protectionism or on trade? Well, INSEAD Assistant Professor of Economics and Political Science David Hemis has written a paper on this topic, and he joins us now to discuss it. David, welcome to INSEAD Knowledge. Hi. Okay, the paper has a long title. It's uh, Environmental Policy and Directed Technological or Technical Change in a Global Economy, The Dynamic Impact of Unilateral Environmental Policies. That kind of says it all, I guess. <laughs> okay, this builds a two-country, um, kind of two-sector model. Can you walk us through this? Yeah, so, so the idea behind the paper is first to uh, recognize that the type of innovations that you can have in polluting industries can be of two different kinds. So you can have clean innovation that are going to reduce your amount of emission. You can think about it as developing uh, you know, alternative source of energies or alternative to plastics uh, as materials. Or you can have dirty type of innovations that are going to uh, make your sector more productive but also increase the amount of emissions that you get. So once, once you have this, uh, this framework in, uh, in mind, what happens if a country implements uh, a carbon tax or a group of countries implements a carbon tax. Uh, then you're going to have some of the polluting industries are going to move from the regulated group of countries to the unregulated group of countries. And that's what's uh, classically called uh, the pollution of an effect. Now what I show in my research is that there is actually a second more pernicious effect that plays on the direction, the direction of innovation within the polluting sector. Uh, what's, this move is going to, to tip the balance towards more dirty innovation instead of clean innovation. And the reason is that uh, innovation is going to respond to market forces. And so since there is more and more of the market for polluting industries in unregulated countries, then it's, going to, it's not going to try to innovate in this complicated clean technology. It's just going to, res to do the easy, uh, dirty type of innovation. The low demand now for carbon credits. So we have the EU trying to revive carbon prices in the face of that. And then you have the US trying to revive cap and trade. What do you, what do you make of all of this? Uh, the type of policies that are often undertaken in terms of trying to support directly clean technologies have uh, some uh, are not necessarily very well designed because they tend to support too much the use of clean technologies instead of the development uh, of new, more effective clean technologies. So to give you an example, in uh, the cap and trade bill that uh, eventually failed in the US, there were 190 billion for clean technologies total. 190 or 119? One, uh, 190. Mm -hmm. But only 20 of these were devoted for, were supposed to be targeted at R&D. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty small. And that means that, you know, you keep using a, a lot of quite ineffective uh, clean technologies and you could use this resource uh, more easily. And, you know, it, you probably want to help also the development of the sector because it's going to be difficult to innovate in a sector that has absolutely zero market, but it seems that the balance is off. And are carbon taxes or tariffs the way to go, kind of in, uh, in light of carbon trading schemes that aren't getting anywhere, obviously, as you've just said? In terms of, you know, trying to think about unilateral policies, uh, actually carbon taxes or cap and trade system are going to be relatively similar. If you give the allowances for free, um, that may be, in fact, a bit better than a carbon tax. Uh, because you're going to shield to some extent uh, your industry from uh, international competition. Uh, so the reason, in fact, why the carbon trading system has not, you know, taken, taken off more uh, in Europe is because the cap is pretty low. Uh, so the way, the way to go there would be to actually, um, to actually um, lower the cap and then the price of carbon will, uh, will increase. But a lot of free allowances were given at the beginning. And, uh, but, but I think that this type of policies, and, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be useful, uh, but they cannot be, you cannot do everything through that. You should also think about developing uh, clean technologies because, uh, well, in, in order to try to, pro, to build a comparative advantage in this sector and not to lose too much to uh, the rest of the world. And if you think about yourself as being a small country or a small coalition, then with carbon taxes, you're not going to be able to change much emissions, because even if you cut completely your emissions, then you're not going to change much 
uh, what happens in the world. Well, if you, if you become a leader in clean technologies, when the world when will finally come up to the table for some form of a general agreement, then you can come up and have actually and be actually a leader in a useful technology and diffuse it to, to the rest of the world. So. so we've talked a little bit here about fragmented energy policies. Um, what, what impact are these maybe having in terms of commerce or trade or protectionism? So that's so. In terms of commerce, it's a bit difficult to to measure uh, because you know these are like there's not like a single good event that you could actually measure and say this is these are the consequences. Uh, so there are, however, some I mean quite a lot of research on this and so on numerical models, for instance, uh, people have estimated that the leakage rate is of 20 percent. So the leakage rate that means that. If, say, Europe were to cut its emission by 10%, then that will increase emission in the rest of the world by 2%. So only through you know, reallocation of, uh, of trade. Um, there is another experiment, uh, another emp more empirical paper, sorry, uh, that looks at the impact of signing the Kyoto Protocol. And what these uh, researchers uh, have found is that if you sign, uh, when countries sign the Kyoto Protocol, they tend to reduce their emissions by around 7%. However, uh, the total amount of emissions embodied in their consumption, so not only you know, what's produced domestically, but also what they import, does not change. How, so, how is, oh, so they import more of what they So they just didn't import make. more of what they emit. So there, these results are really big, and that seems, you know, that would suggest like a 100% leakage rate, right? So that seems maybe too, I mean, maybe too much, but they, are, they seem to be big. They could be a big effect. And we've seen thousand countries building up a comparative advantage over time in energy intensive sectors. That could be part of the reason. So all of this probably means, too, that um, the pricing of carbon might differ widely across countries and, and, and continents, and maybe some countries, therefore, would be at a disadvantage when it comes to trade. Have you found anything along that line? In that sense, what countries could do is that there would be two options. You know, uh, One option is a bit what I, I told, talked about before would be, well, then you should try to develop your, your clean technologies, uh, trying to compete with, uh, with uh, the unregulated countries in in this, and maybe in the future you'll reap some benefit. The problem is that it's relatively, that requires quite a uh, long-term horizon. Mm -hmm. The other thing you could do is simply actually, well, from a pure economically prospect, but that's not particularly environmentally friendly, you would just realize that we're not going to compete on energy intensive, uh, intensive goods. We're going to make uh, our own energy for domestic, for non tradable goods cleaner, but for things that are tradable, we're just going to import from abroad and specialize in goods that do not require that much, uh, that much energy in the first place. Do you have kind of an optimal mix between uh, sustainable trade and growth and environmental policy? Is there some kind of global or at least regional idea that you have here, what the balance should be? If you could find uh, a global agreement, uh, the for the entire world, the optimal mix would be to have a relatively strong, but not too strong carbon tax uh, or cap and trade system, something, something equivalent. Uh, now, and a strong push towards developing uh, clean technologies to actually help them catch up and take off the ground. And once, you know, once this is done, there is no reason to think that you will have long run uh, cost on growth. Well, you, there would be uh, transitional period where growth is attenuated because you need to start up a sector that's not very effective at, at, uh, at the moment, but in the long run there would be no, no huge cost. And, but of course uh, if you cannot come up with this form of general agreement, then the, the optimal mix would involve also something like a carbon tax and clean water and resource subsidies, but on top of this you, know, you want to have some barriers uh, to trade in order to slow down uh, the movement uh, of polluting industries towards non-regulating countries. So a bit of a carrot and a stick, sort of the stick on the carbon taxes and the carrot for the development. Yes, that's, uh, I mean that's that's yes, that's that's exactly it. You want to you want to force your your polluting sector to become cleaner over time, but you also want to reduce already your emission. And the problem, in some sense, is that if you you know it take, it's going to take some time as well for uh, research to pay off. So it's going to take some time for clean technologies to become 
actually very competitive. So let me end by asking you what you consider the main takeaway is of this research paper that you've prepared. If you think about going unilaterally, uh, you really don't want to forget about trying to develop uh, your clean technologies at home. Trying to develop, you, you really don't want to forget the, the carrot, uh, as we said, as you, you mentioned before. I think that's the main takeaway. Okay, so we'll all remember carrots. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much, David Hemmes, for being with us on NCED Knowledge. Thank you.